After serving a 10-year coaching apprenticeship, Italian football coach Arrigo Sacchi's Palmer played Silvio Berlusconi's AC Milan in the 1987 Coppa Italia. Palmer won the game and afterwards Berlusconi offered Sacchi a job. This is a story of Sacchi creating one of the greatest club sides in the history of football. Welcome to The Luke Alfred Show. I have 30 years of experience on the front lines of sports journalism, covering some of the biggest games in cricket, rugby, the FIFA World Cup and even the Olympic Games. Come and join me as we learn about some of the greatest sports stories you've never heard. I'm Luke Alfred and welcome to the show. It's fun watching old European Cup clashes on YouTube, which is basically what my life as a once esteemed sports journalist has boiled down to. Nowadays, I frantically scour the back of my brain for new podcast subjects in an attempt to impress my 26-year-old son and show that, as I approach 60, I'm as suave of body and mind as he is. Take the famous tie at the Maracanã. That's the one in Belgrade, mind you, between Red Star Belgrade and AC Milan in November 1988, a tie that signaled the beginning of what was to become a time of bounty and riches for the Arrigo Sacchi coached AC Milan. As much as I want to watch the football, I often find my eye wandering away from the football, frustrated that there are so few cameras and that the action is so terribly circumscribed by the size of my laptop screen. Why can't I see more of what I want to see? I want to see the stands and the light and the coaching staff, what such and such is wearing and whether such and such a coach relied on that ultimate football accessory of days gone by, the fab khaki trench coat, replete of course with cigarette, the cigarette giving depth and meaning to his furious but silent touchline cogitations. Take the match in question between Red Star and Milan on a winter's day in Yugoslavia as it still was in those days. Watch carefully as afternoon fog rolls in from the Danube and eventually you'll note two members of the Red Star bench wearing beanies, a sighting which has all the thrill of seeing a pride of lions pass in front of your car in the Kruger National Park. On second thoughts, calling them beanies is to flatter them rather than knitted caps of the kind that Granny Lily or Aunt Doris came up with at birthdays. The knitted caps, or beanies if you prefer, hark back to a different era. A different era in football, which of course doubles as a different era sartorially. They're actually quite cute. You almost expect these guys to whip out the box of matches and start a touchline fire. Soon they'll be warming their hands, while keeping a watchful eye on the football, of course, and bringing out the chestnuts, or maybe even the marshmallows. Can you imagine Pep Guardiola or Mikel Arteta in a knitted cap in Manchester City or Arsenal colours, possibly with a pom-pom thrown in? Those days, part of the European Cup's prehistory, a sort of Bronislav Malinowski moment, are long gone. I miss them. If we're getting all anthropological, let me just say that I don't miss everything about European football's prehistory. I don't miss the ridiculously skimpy shorts or the shin guards the size of tugboats. I don't miss Hugo Sanchez's perm, which, befitting a footballer from Mexico, was the size of, well, Mexico. I don't miss the obnoxiously violent crowds who would go to war because an opposing fan looked at you for too long. I don't miss what from today's all-seater perspective looks like a disturbingly laissez-faire approach to stadium security. There are reasons to be nostalgic. Equally, there are reasons to move right on. The second leg tie between Red Star and Milan, won all on aggregate after the match at the San Siro, is notorious for a couple of other things besides dodgy headwear on the Belgrade bench. If you, like me, have a remarkable facility for forgetting important birthdays other than your own, but can remember how many times Uruguay have won the World Cup, then you'll also remember that this match was infamous for Goran Vasilevicic's horrific header on Milan's Roberto Donadoni. If you've watched the match on YouTube, You'll note that although the incident appeared innocuous at first viewing, 
partly attributable to the television camera technology of the time, it was anything but. With the score at 1-1 and 2-2 on aggregate, the match had been warming up through the half. To wit, two minutes before he was fouled by Vasilevicic, Donadoni was brought down heavily on the red star right, which suggests that he might have been singled out for special attention as an important cog in the Arrigo Sacchi evolving Milan machine. Coach Sacchi, let me add as a helpful aside, who wouldn't have been seen dead in a beanie come knitted cap thingy because, of course, he was an Italian and Italians are less inclined than Yugoslavians to look like men who live under bridges. The early tackle on Donadoni was the kind of tackle that provided West German referee Dieter Pauli with a poser. There might have been room for a card, but with more than a half of the tie still left, it was probably the right decision to give Milan a free kick instead. Pauli had been pretty heavy with the cards in the previous day's abandoned encounter because of fog and steadily reducing visibility, sending off Milan's Pietro Paolo Verdes. Perhaps he had learnt his lesson. Speculation aside, the context of the following day's replay was one of steadily rising temperature. Tackles flew in. Amazing how, when we want to signify intent, tackles suddenly take to the air and fly, and the atmosphere was getting restive. A couple of minutes later, shortly before the end of the first half, as the ball ballooned out of Red Star defence as they dealt with an iffy Milan cross, Donadoni climbed for a header in an attempt to head the ball back towards the Red Star goal. Ranging up towards him in a very plausible approximation of competing for the header was Vasilevicic. Donadoni's problem was that while he was watching the ball in front of him, the Red Star defender came at him over his right shoulder, where Donadoni couldn't see him. In effect, Donadoni was blindsided. Vasilevicic clattered into him with force. Miraculously, Donadoni won the header, which he paid for with a broken jaw after being violently elbowed. He was probably unconscious before he hit the ground. Versions of the event depart at this point. Some accounts say that Donadoni was kept alive by the quick-wittedness of a red star physio who broke his jaw, allowing air to reach his lungs. A more plausible explanation is found in The Immortals, such as autobiography, in which he wrote that the first person to reach Donadoni was the Milan masseur, who had the presence of mind to prise open Donadoni's jaw, shut tight because it was fractured, and free the player's tongue, which was choking him. Later, Pagani gave Donadoni mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. After several long and terrifying minutes, Donadoni's legs started to flap and twitch, the television cameras spending some of this time helpfully on a long and meaningful look at the scoreboard. Donadoni was later taken off on a stretcher to an ambulance. Pagani, the Milan masseur, had saved Donadoni's life. No further goals were scored, so the tie, locked at 2-2 after the two legs, went to penalties. Milan scored four of theirs, while Red Star, in front of their own fans, and after having been leading in the previous day's abandoned game, missed two of theirs, meaning Milan won the penalty shootout 4-2. They were through to the competition's quarter-finals. The European Cup resumed the following March after the midwinter recess. Milan were drawn against Werder Bremen. Donadoni fouled so badly at the Maracanã in Belgrade that much of the stadium feared he might have died, played both home and away against Bremen. So too did Marco van Basten, who scored the 31st minute penalty that was the difference between the teams in the second leg at the San Siro, after matters ended up 0-0 in Bremen in the first. So too did Ruud Hullet, formerly of PSV Eindhoven. Although his knee was injured going into the second leg against Red Star, when Donadoni was stretched off, Hullet insisted that Saatchi allow him to take Donadoni's place, and he played the full second half. 
Although he didn't take one himself, his team snuck through on penalties. Sachi admired Hullet. He not only liked his heart, but warmed to his football intelligence, what Sachi called his mentality. Sachi made much of footballing intelligence, possibly because he was obliged to make much of his own football intelligence, stressing throughout that technically capable footballers weren't good enough for him. They also needed to be smart and capable of subsuming their skill to the needs of the greater whole, something Hullet never had any difficulty in doing. Sachi hadn't played, you see. He was born in Italy's northeast in 1946. Fuzigano, the town in which he grew up, was reduced to rubble during the closing stages of the Second World War, and Sachi was initially a lowly salesman in his father's shoe factory close to Ravenna. In his spare time, he coached Baraka Luko, the local team, ostensibly because he wasn't good enough to play for them. He immediately faced a crisis of authority. Quote, I was 26, my goalkeeper was 39, and my centre forward was 32, said Sachi. I had to win them over. He won them over by the application of his intelligence, an intelligence that was refined, backward-looking. Sachi loved Honfed, the great Hungarian club side of the 1950s, and stubborn. Sachi wasn't only a student of football history. He was also sensitive to the dynamic teams of the era, the Dutch of the 1970s and the great Brazilian teams, including the famous World Cup winning Brazil of the 1970 World Cup, who beat Italy in the final. To him, what was happening off the ball was as important as what was happening on it. He has spoken in interview, for example, giving expression to what fans of the great game watching on television the world over have experienced, of actually wanting to get into the television set, because that's the best way, surely, of being able to see what's happening off the ball. Not to be rehearsed in any detail here, Sachi's apprenticeship was long and tedious, taking in Cesena, Rimini, Fiorentina and Parma. At Parma, a breakthrough. He beat Milan twice in the Coppa Italia, once in the group phase and once in the knockouts. This was enough to be noticed by Silvio Berlusconi, now owner of Milan and himself to, quote Shakespeare, a man with vaulting ambition. I imagine that when he first addressed the assembled Milan players, players like Alessandro Costacurta and Franco Baresi, Sachi didn't dwell overly long on the subject of being an ex-shoe salesman for his father's factory, who liked watching teams from elsewhere in Europe on television. He did, apparently, throw down the gauntlet to the players, however, telling them that they'd won precious little in the last 20 years. That was about to change, he said. He challenged them. As befits someone with autodidactic tendencies, Sachi was very clear with his Milan players about the part they would play in the dynamic whole, whether they were going forward or whether they were defending. He was big on the concept of shadow play, where all 11 players took up their positions on the field without the presence of the opposition. Sachi would shout, quote, The ball's in the opposition's control, just in the Milan half, eight metres inside the far touchline, and all 11 Milan players would take up their defensive positions. The prime example of this defensive alignment was what Sachi called the short team, which strikes one as a startlingly literal translation from the Italian. Note, no long or medium team or flat team or flat white team, simply a short one, which on the face of it sounds like a team who could be vulnerable to the high ball in particular and the aerial game in general. So what exactly was the short team if it wasn't a team of the vertically challenged? It was a team who compacted play. According to Sachi, there was never to be more than 25 metres between the last defender and the most forward striker at any one time. Space therefore was compact, short, This short team concept was combined, often brilliantly by Milan, with a slick offsides trap marshalled by Baresi and Costa Curta. Quote, 
I used to tell my players that if we played with 25 meters from the last defender to the center forward, given our ability, nobody could beat us. And thus, the team had to move as a unit up and down the pitch, but also from left to right. Such he is quoted as saying in Jonathan Wilson's helpful book on the evolution of football tactics, Inverting the Pyramid. At first, progress was not uniform. Carlo Ancelotti, in particular, took time to adapt to Sachi's new system at Milan when he arrived in his late twenties from Roma. Like the well-liked but slightly dull boy in class worth making sacrifices for, Sachi asked Ancelotti to arrive early at training. Sachi was there too, as were some of the boys from the Milan youth team. Again and again, Sachi would take Ancelotti through the plays, the short team. Soon Carlo would sing with the best of them. Ancelotti didn't play in the Belgrade fog against Red Star in the 1988-9 European Cup campaign, but was in the Milan side for the quarter-final against Bremen. He was also in the Milan side, just behind Hullet and Marco van Basten, for the semi-final against Real Madrid in April, pairing with Frank Raycard in the centre of midfield. So too, by the way, was Donadoni. He had recovered from having his jaw broken at the Maracanã the previous November and was to become a crucial player in Milan's European forays under Sacchi, along with the other wide midfielder, the less detected Angelo Colombo. Milan's first match in the two-legged semi-final after their quarter-final victory over Bremen was against Real Madrid, away at the Bernabeu. Real hadn't won the European Cup since they beat Partizan of Yugoslavia at Hazel in Belgium over 20 years before, but they had beaten a spirited PSV with Romario and Berry van Erl in their midst in a tight quarter-final, a PSV side who won the next year's European Cup. It was by no means a done deal that Milan would progress. Indeed, it didn't look as though they would against a Madrid side coached at the time by the canny Leo Bienhacker, who videos show looking like an aging rock and roller with a ducktail. Maybe Leo sang Elvis covers or was Mr. Karaoke at the team get-together. Sanchez, the Mexican, fired Real Madrid ahead with a left-footed volley from the floor just before half-time after a flick-on at a corner. Milan needed to wait deep into the second half for the equaliser, and this after Hullet had been substituted by Verdes. It eventually came in the 74th minute, thanks to an indecently good long-range Van Basten header that clipped the underside of the Real Madrid crossbar and popped over the line. Milan had burgled the away goal, and one all it remained going into the second leg. Just over 73,000 fans packed into the San Siro two weeks later to witness one of the great European Cup victories, the game that effectively launched Sacchi as a manager and launched Milan as a vintage side. Ancelotti was the first to score for Milan, vindicating all those early morning training sessions with Sacchi and the Milan youth teams with a sublimely crisp blast from range. Seven minutes later, Raycard made it two from a close header and Hullet made it three again with the head just before half time. Perhaps Real Madrid played so badly because they were all wearing blue. Van Basten was on hand with a fourth from a slickly engineered move initiated by Hullet just after the break and, appropriately, the last of Milan's five goals was by Donna Doni, who had literally been knocked senseless in the second leg tie against Red Star the previous November, a challenge the German referee chose to do nothing about. Quote, Buyo in the Madrid goal, says the Italian commentator with arch understatement after he lets in the fifth, is not having the best night of his career. Milan's opponents in the final were Stoya Bucharest, winners of the European Cup in the 1986-7 season when they beat Barcelona. Stoya were no pushovers. In George Hadji, Marius Lakatouche and winger Ili Dumitrescu, they had three of the finest players in Europe. Hadji was as slippery as a chicken breast. He was quick, had a thunderous left-footed shot from range 
and was a fine dribbler of the ball, but alas, he was no match for a rampaging short team from Milan. With two goals apiece to Hullet and Van Basten, Milan won the European Cup final against Stoya 4-0. Years later, Saatchi would say, quote, By the time we'd reached the final, we'd scored 10 goals in three games. We'd killed everyone. There were 80,000 Italians at the final in Barcelona, and it was a hugely emotional moment for the club. The long and short of it was that the 10 goals Milan scored in the three games at the end of the 1988-9 tournament were as close to perfection as such you would ever get. Milan won the European Cup again the following season, beating Real Madrid again before taking care, unconvincingly, of Bayern Munich in a later round. In the final they met Benfica, beating them by a record goal in Vienna. Despite their European Cup double, their moment had passed. The short team were becoming long in the tooth. Sachi had never forged as comfortable a relationship with Van Basten as he had with Hullet, and injuries took their toll on Van Basten's fading career, as they did with the dreadlocked one, himself no stranger to the strop. Think of his massive fallout, for example, with Johan Cruyff. In the following year's European Cup, Milan were held nil-nil by Bruges at the San Siro and then squeaked home in Belgium thanks to an Angelo Carboni goal, with Van Basten being sent off late in the day. The stuttering victory over Bruges signalled more than simply a bad day at the office because in March 1991, Milan lost to Marseille in the quarter-finals. The teams drew at the San Siro, but the second leg in Marseille was marred by controversy, with Marseille leading 1-0 in the tie and 2-1 on aggregate, thanks to a second-half Chris Waddle goal, two of the four floodlights at Marseille's ground failed. Power was restored 15 minutes later, but at that point the Milan vice-president, Adriano Galliani, refused to allow Milan back onto the pitch, doubtless hoping for a replay. UEFA subsequently awarded the tie rather bizarrely 3 0 to Marseille, and with Jean Pierre Papin and Basile Bolli in their midst, they went on to win that season's competition. Milan were banned from European competition for a season, and Galliani, a man about whom Sachi has spoken glowingly as being crucial in the rise of the club, was suspended for two years. In November 1991, Sacchi became Italy coach. The shoe salesman had walked his Milan road. It was all over. Nowadays, the articulate and extremely likeable Sacchi is a pundit on Italian television. He will no doubt be asked to produce appropriate-sized nuggets of wisdom when Milan play Napoli in the Champions League quarter-final in a couple of days' time. This might be slightly more fraught than usual because he has recently been caught in a tawdry exchange with Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who accused him on Italian television of, quote, talking too much. Zlatan might be onto something here, for Sachi has become fond of his own voice, although, let it be said, the television encourages this type of thing without ever recognizing that it encourages this type of thing. Then again, it probably all boils down to the fact that Sachi has been critical of the ageless wonder and Milan's Zlatan is salty at being criticised by a former shoe salesman. It'll be interesting to see how the two pair off in their tie, these giants of the Italian game. Finally, a coda. This pointed out to me by my good mate Ian Hawkey, the football encyclopedia. The 5-0 defeat by Milan at the San Siro shaped modern Real Madrid. In Ian's words, it was a, quote, intolerable humiliation, and it burned deep into the Madrid psyche. Real president Florentino Perez watched his team's dismemberment in the 1988-9 European Cup semi-final and vowed it would never happen again. So the seeds of recruiting what came to be known as the Galacticos began. Philosophically speaking, as a concept, it's a little thin, I think you'll agree, for it has none of the attractive, boffin-like nerdiness that led to the discovery of the short team and the offside trap slick as the bolt on an old-fashioned Lee-Enfield rifle. Looked at from the vantage point of the present, 
Sachi's Milan look like a team off in the far distance. But at the time, they were revolutionaries banging down the gates at the beginning of modern football history. Long live, say I. Long live the romantics, the purists and the thinkers about the game. Let them talk too much.